Good morning. And what a joy it is to say welcome and to see people sitting in those places where I have been saying good morning to for the last several weeks. And in fact, I shouldn't say that. It, it was from my living room that I was saying good morning and welcome. And it's a delight to see you, to welcome you, to welcome others who are joining with us at home. Because one of the things I want us to understand fully is that we will not be totally and fully exuberant until all our people are able to be with us and to celebrate with us again our gathering as we are this morning. Um, I, I don't know how I felt. I, I think I slept last night. Um, I, I've just been thinking about, you know, trying to put faces to seats and so on, and I try to tell myself, no, don't, don't say, oh, no, who, you, who will you be looking for tomorrow? And, who, and I, as I walked in, I just tried to, as we prayed this morning, I said to the men as we were praying with, I trust that if, 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 if we miss anyone this morning, we will not miss the Lord. This is, this is what we are all about. And so I welcome you. It's good to see you. It's good to have you uh, in us. And it will be a delight to share this morning uh, last week we had a, a dry run, as we call it, and I spoke mostly to empty chairs. There was about five people here, that, that is, the people who are doing um, their, their stuff. And so this morning, it's, 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 it's a joy uh, to, to welcome you. I have a number of announcements to make because we're meeting in a very different venue than we did before. Our offering this morning will be dropped at boxes as you're leaving. There, there are boxes at, at both sides. And so when you're leaving, the, you, you drop your offering in. Now, don't forget to drop it in because I'll dog your steps if, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> you know me better than that. But um, that's where we will be uh, doing offering. Also, when we are leaving the service this morning, you will leave through those doors. And um, if anyone cannot use the steps, then go that way. But according to the, the laws of the land right now, we are to enter, enter in one door and leave through another door. And so we want to do all that we can to protect you, to have respect for one another, and also, as one Peter tells us, that we are supposed to obey those who are over us governmentally. And... Um, there are limits to which they can go, and when they reach that limit, we will have to say it's better to obey God rather than man. But until that time, I think we can um, do what we're doing this morning and meet as we're meeting. Uh, thank you so much for, for wearing your mask. Um, I should tell you this very interestingly. Lois and I just refinanced our home uh, because the, 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 um, the um, interest rates have gone down. So we thought we'll take advantage of this. So we had to go to the bank to sign the, the, the papers. And as we were getting ready to go in, I put my mask on. And I said to Lois, isn't it interesting going into a bank and before you enter in to mask yourself? But that was not the end of the story. As the guy opened the door for us, he said, um, you know, Mr. Thurton, as I was getting ready to open this door, I thought, isn't it amazing that a banker would open the door for two masked people coming into the <laughs> bank. So the mask has just transformed our entrances. But I said to people last week, and I say to you, we might not be able to smile with our lips, but we can smile with our eyes. And, and so when you, you will not be able to greet one another and hug one another and so on, that will come later on. But until then, greet one another with your eyes. Let me give you some announcements. Class, my class will meet tonight as usual on the Zoom at 6 o'clock. And we are still looking at discipline, uh, discipline habits for spiritual life. And um, we are also hoping that um, that will, will come to an end soon, but we don't know how soon that will take place. There are some churches that are not opening until next year. And that's their prerogative. But uh, so we will have our Wednesday night and our my class and the other classes to meet at on Zoom as we have been uh, doing it. The back of your bulletin 
you have uh, just a little word that I wrote to thank the people. And, and the danger of this is that you almost always miss somebody. So if we, you have been missed, it is not intentional at all. But all the people that have been so faithful um, to help with, with make this possible. And, and I, I don't think that we can do this without me especially make, making mention of, of Steve and Kim and Jacob and Natalie. Uh, these are people whom we have dug into their uh, um, abilities to, um, to uh, technology to help us with this. And, and I, I, I have to give a special word to Dwayne because uh, Dwayne was able to choke Comcast and uh, have them come to the place where uh, he had the language. If, if I had to confront Comcast to get the live stream going, um, I would not be able to because I wouldn't know what they're doing. But Dwayne and so to the rest of you, thank you so very much. In the midst of, of a service like this, there are always times of joy and times of sorrow. And the sorrow is not what you would be acquainted with. How many of you know of J.I. Packer? A few of you. Well, he died um, on Friday. And J.I. Packer has had a profound influence on your pastor and around the world. Um, we are big, we, tonight at our discipline, uh, <laughs> discipleship class, we'll be talking about books, because books are one of the ways that we develop um, our spiritual habits. And I'm, I'm going to be suggesting his great book, where uh, Knowing God. Um, it's something similar to, J, uh, to uh, um, um, A.W. Tosa, but it's not the same. Um, his is more technical, but very, very warm. And if you want a good book to read about knowing God, J.I. Packer's book is one of the best uh, along with A.W. Tozer. Um, I want to say a special, I, I, I've already told our pianist that although we're going to wish Kim happy birthday, we're not going to sing happy birthday to her because uh, <laughs> um, you can't, you're not supposed to. As someone said when you sing, by the way, sing with your library voice. Don't get it, do you? <laughs> In library, you're quiet. So sing with your, your, your library voice. But Kim, happy birthday. Must be nice to be 25. Uh, 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 thank you so very much. Again. <laughs> um, I'm trying to see now if I have missed any announcement um, at all. Wednesday, we will return to our study of Deuteronomy because I think that that book is a great book that will help us to deal with even the times in which we are living. Um, it's good to have the singers back. Um, we were blessed by Gwen singing um, solos while we were in transit, and we're glad that the singers are back together uh, this morning, and Colleen um, at the piano. Well, while we were, um, we want to tell you we're on live stream, and you might, some of you might know that we, we have gone from Steve's living room to live stream, and, and if you want to know how effective this thing is, I guess the first Sunday when I spoke with a mask on, it, it was fogging up every time I would bend over and so on, and, and I made mention of it. Well, two Two weeks ago, a package came home, and I just gave it to Lois. And uh, one of my cousins, whom I hadn't seen for about 40 years, was listening to the service in California and heard me say about this, and she made this for me and sent it. And uh, now I can bend down and bend up, and I am not fogged up. And uh, so... There are many ways in which the Lord has been using this. We have heard from people across North America with our ministry uh, here at Sodaville. And uh, so we praise God for what he's doing. But one thing that I said that 
I will not perform for the camera. Um, I want to make sure that this is the house of the Lord and we keep it that way. One of the things we did when we were at home and people responded so wonderfully to it was uh, the fact that Lois was reading the scriptures and they got to see another face apart from mine. And uh, so Lois is going to come and with her call to worship, she will read from Psalm 84. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word.
Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we approach your glorious throne because of the invitation from your glorious throne. We would not dare to know who you are and who we are and then to be nonchalant about coming into your presence. We pray, our God, that faith may catch a glimpse of your glorious majesty this morning. That, Father, we will not simply be here because we have longed for this day to come when we could see our friends again. We long for this day to praise the name of the Lord together. We praise you and we thank you for your protecting hands upon our lives since last we met like this. We know, our God, that we were not that smart to have protected ourselves in our going and coming. As we listen to the news from the different ones and from different sources, Lord, we were made aware that only God knows who holds tomorrow. We come to you this morning gladly, Lord, singing and confessing who you are, looking to you that through your spirit, Father, we might meet with the living God this morning. You have spared us for that purpose. Father, we want to be aware again that we are not complete because there are many of our people still at home and for good reasons. And Lord, may they know that they are a part of this prayer this morning, that the Spirit of God is uniting us together, spirit to spirit in one body. And Father, we pray that you will be pleased to, to grant that awareness this morning that, Father, we are not going through some religious exercise. We will hear later on that God has designed his house 
from which he speaks to his people. And until we are able, Lord, to hear your voice in the, the building set aside for God, we pray that you will grant your peace and your direction to everyone involved. And I pray again that spirit will meet spirit this morning where, Lord, friends of ours are at home or away, as I know some are. Now, Lord, we're here this morning to allow our souls to be refreshed in your presence and by the, the spiritual greetings of one to the other. We pray that your spirit will give us a quiet heart, a receptive heart, a humble heart, so that we will hear your word with humble reception. We will, we will worship you with trembling joy this morning. We do pray, Father, that you will grant to us, Lord, a fresh glimpse of yourself. We were singing, may the people praise you. And Lord, that is why we're here this morning, to praise you, to honor you, to look to you, to find our strength in you, to hear your voice, to have our spirits renewed by your spirit. And Father, to leave this place rejoicing that we have met with the living God. We do pray this morning, for Lord, again, for first responders, those who work in danger's presence, those who work in homes, Lord, where they are confronted by this virus, we do ask that you will be with those who work in those homes and protect them. We pray for the police, and we pray, Lord, for those who are given the responsibility as community leaders. No doubt the weight of having to make decisions that will, will affect the lives of people is no small responsibility. And so we look to you, Father, and pray that you will grant wisdom and you will grant protection and you will grant your peace to community leaders. We pray for the president of the country, for the governor of the state. We pray for those in the Supreme Court who are making decisions that, Lord, will affect our lives. We pray that you will give them a sense of their boundaries, that you have given them so much and no more. And Father, I pray honestly that while we thank you for the government and while we thank you for the federal leaders, and Father, while we find, we find it disturbing when we hear the divisiveness with which mayors are speaking, and Father, we do not agree with everything that they are doing, but oh God, what great privilege we have to be able to look to you because finally and ultimately our citizenship is in heaven and we obey earthly governments in obedience to our citizenship in heaven. And so I pray that you will give us the wisdom. Make us, Lord, to live such beautiful lives that those who are critical of the church, those who are blaming the church for COVID-19, and, and Lord, they will be put to shame as we as your people live such lives of beauty and humility that they will know that no one apart from God's people can live this way. We do pray, Father, for those who are not with us this morning because of illness. Please remember Doris. We pray for Dorothy and for Robert. We pray, Father, for uh, Martha. We pray too, Lord, for uh, Joyce as she has, Lord, been set aside by an accident. And we thank you that she has been made, Lord, um, she has been kept from broken bones, and it could have been because it was a very serious one. So please be with these, we pray this morning. We, we pray, Father, for those who are struggling because of, of what is happening. We, we know of some, and we pray that you will draw near to them, and that, Lord, you will speak to their hearts. 
and you will give them the ability to find their rest in you today. Lord, we do not want to forget our missionaries, and we pray for the Bormans this morning. We pray for your blessing and for your protection. We pray for, Lord, your guidance for them. Please give them wisdom to know when to come and how to come, when to go and how to go. We pray that you will watch over their family, over the ministry to which you have called them. And Father, we pr what we pray for them, we pray for the Lloyds and for the Nelsons and for, Lord, the, the, the many that we are conscious of, the Vegas, the Elliots. We pray, Father, that you will remember them this morning. And Father, we want to pray for other churches in Lebanon that are opening today and perhaps for the first time or second time. We pray again that for these ministries, Lord, there will be the sense of unity. There will be the sense of joy that right around the corner, up the street, down the street, are believers who are meeting doing exactly what we're doing here. And I pray, Father, that righteousness and peace and joy will flow from the places where your word is declared this morning. Lord, you know that the people now meet in a different way than we have been meeting before. At this point in our service, we would be taking up the offering. And Father, I thank you, first of all, for the faithfulness of the people here while we have not been able to meet for the last three months or so. Please bless those, Lord, who are setting aside at home, who will mail in their offerings, and those who will drop it in the drop boxes at the end of this service. We are grateful to you for your continual provision for us, and we pray that we will see the beauty and the glory of God, Lord, destroying evil from our pathway, we pray. We give you our grateful thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please be seated. So good to be here this morning. I want to read from Psalm 122. And let's stand in reverence to the reading of God's word. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father, we praise you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you, God. You have blessed us. You have provided. You have loved. You have sustained since early March. And here we are again together. Lord, we're trusting you to do as you've done in the past, in the future. Now be with our pastor. Give him wisdom, guidance, and courage. May your word do what you promised it would in our hearts for our good and your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. From the last or days, I suppose, in March and beginning in April and May <clears throat> and June, I have been preaching and teaching from my living room at home. As good as that had been, has been, it is not as good as being here this morning before you. As the months came and as they went, I sighed under my breath that perhaps this is the last Sunday I'll have to speak this way from home. And I kept hoping and hoping and hoping. And then we thought we would start again gathering on the 5th, and that was not possible. And then we thought the 12th, and we th that was not possible. And one very large church in Atlanta, the pastor just said, he, he is just sick and tired of having to say, next week, next month. So he said, we're not going to open until next year. Well, I'm not about to do that um, because I am glad that we are able to come in the title of the message this morning, finally. Finally. Amazing, is it? Isn't it? I remember when our daughter was, was little, we were traveling in what is known as Trans Canada uh, um, Highway. This is a highway that runs right across Canada from one end to the next. And we were taking part of that trip from Toronto. We were on our way to a place called Sault Ste. Marie. Only if you're a Canadian, you know where that is. It's way up way up there. And Heather would, in that day, we had a, a little compact, uh, uh, it was a radio, a cassette player, and a three and a half inches TV screen. And every so often she would be asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And so the next time we were, we were going, her wise mother decided to put little things in packages for Heather so that when we thought she was getting to the place where she would be asking, are we there yet? We give her one of these things. And she never asked again because she always had something with which to play until they got to, and finally, finally. Well, that's how we feel this morning. Finally. We looked forward to this Sunday. 
We look forward to regathering. I spoke to many of you. And again and again, I heard from you, I cannot wait to get back to church. They were concerned that they did not see their, their friends, could not talk with them as they did before. And as I was uh, contemplating what word would God give to us for this Sunday as we come together again, beginning to regather and to reopen, my attention was taken to Psalm 122. Because Psalm 122 is a psalm dealing with traveling, pilgrimage, moving from one place to a certain place. And I'm not going to deal too much with the details. I'm going to look at how it applies to what we have been experiencing during the past three and a half months or whatever time it has been. And I want to call your attention, first of all, to what I call the anticipation, the anticipation for gathering. It, it seems that, that they were traveling now toward Jerusalem. And, and someone, someone had said to, to the group how it was, it was said, I am not told, we are not told. But someone said, and they responded, I was glad when they said to me, when they said to us, someone said, if you please, isn't it amazing? Next Sunday we're gathering together. Isn't it amazing? Next Sunday we'll be gathering together. Isn't it amazing? But th there was something that stirred the people when they were inviting, invited to anticipate gathering. Listen to what he says. I was glad. I was glad. The, the word for glad is to, to, to express that which brings pleasure. That which actually causes someone to feel a sense of excitement inside of them. I, I suppose it is, it is like the, the individual who is waiting to see his wife for the first time in her white wedding gown marching down the aisle by her father. And he turns around. I remember one time I was conducting, I conducted several weddings in Toronto, of course, but I was, this one wedding, and the, the groom turned around to see his bride coming up the aisle, and he just started to cry. It was quite an interesting experience for me. I've never seen that before. But when he turned, by the way, excuse me for, as I said that, you know what I forgot to mention? I forgot to mention that Cora and Leonard celebrating their 63rd wedding anniversary a week ago. 63rd, and I don't want to tell you what Leonard said to me about what Cora provided for him that day, but I'll leave it like that. But, but here, here is this excitement as he turned around. And each of us has experienced that, that has had that opportunity. Well, the psalmist is saying something that is unique for you and for me. I can't wait until we get together again. I know how, have you noticed that one of the words that is being used today on the news concerning getting together is the word together? Together? I've noticed it. All of, we are in this together. Together we can make it happen. Well, we are not only coming together, we're coming together for a purpose. There is a feeling of, of excitement. The invitation stirs up the emotions because we are going to be doing what we have not been able to do, what we have been able to do with the freedom and the privilege and the blessing that it has been. And it has been almost like my mother used to say, you never miss the water until the well runs dry. That's how we felt when we were, weren't able to get together again. We missed the fellowship and how we took it for granted, not carelessly, but we knew next week we're going to be together again. And we came back, and next week we're going to be together again. And, but all of a sudden we couldn't do that. And my friends, I want to say what I said earlier, that we will not be totally excited until everyone who is not with us today is with us again. Those who can't make it, 
those who feel that it is not safe to make it. We want them to know that we embrace them, embrace them in the fellowship this morning, that we miss them and we hope that they miss us. And we are looking forward to the day when we can greet them with our eyes. And then we all look forward to the day when we can take the mask off and greet one another with our lips. I don't mean kissing, I mean just saying something. <laughs> the anticipation of gathering. I remember when Lois and I were in Israel. We landed in Tel Aviv. And, and from Tel Aviv, we took an air-conditioned bus and we made our way through that great country, little as it is. And it was not until a week after we had landed in Tel Aviv that we were going to get to go to Jerusalem. And, and as we were all in the bus, I think we were coming from Jericho, and as we, 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 dro we drove, whatever corner it was, Jerusalem appeared before us. It was nighttime. And the lights were just beaming from that city. We didn't know where we were, but the bus driver, Amos, Amos, as we say, was our bus driver. And, and I thought about the excitement. And every one of us, 42 of us, ministers from, from Can across Canada, we, we looked out the window, and all of a sudden, the fellow who played the trumpet started to play the song, Jerusalem. It was an exciting experience because finally, this country that I have studied, we have studied, the anticipation of being in places where we had been reading about, and there it was, finally. Finally, we were there. But I want you to see something about this anticipating of gathering. It, it, it was not only getting there, but it's what do you do when you get there? Look at the establishment. Listen to what he said. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord. Who made it the house of the Lord? In Exodus 25, God told Moses, I want you to build me a sanctuary. And these are the specification. The sanctuary that you're going to build, when you listen to my instructions, will be a replica of the sanctuary that is in heaven. So, so that earthly sanctuary there was to be something of a voice to the world and an object lesson for the people who would be in that sanctuary. I want to break this down somehow. It was called a sanctuary. And then it was called a temple. And in Luke Jesus calls it my house, my house. David wanted to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord said to David, no, you won't build a house for me. And I, as I was studying this, I started to look at that text. Please listen. It is one thing to build a house for the Lord, and it's another thing to build a house of the Lord. Let me explain it to you. When you build a house for the Lord, you put in that house where you want, what you want, and God has to accept it, or so we think. When he told Moses to build this sanctuary, God told him not only what to build, but how to build and what the contents were to be. For, for, for hundreds of years in this country, whenever you walked into a church, there was the centrality of the cross. There was the pulpit. 
and there was the, bap, the, the communion table. And every time people walked into the, the house of the Lord, they were made aware. See, Exodus 25 and verse 8, God says this, you will build this temple according to my specification, and I will speak with you from the mercy seat. I will speak with you. The voice in the house of the Lord is the voice of the Lord, not the voice of man. And in the early 80s, going into the 90s, I noticed something as I was traveling around, speaking in different churches, different denominations, but one thing was happening. Slowly but surely, the cross was removed. Surely but slowly, the pulpit was removed. There are certain churches where you go today and the, the platform is like a living room where families meet. My friends, that's not what God says that Moses should do. You don't build the house of God like the home. The home gets its instruction from the house of the Lord because he speaks there. And so David wanted to build a house for the Lord and he was going to put in that house what he thought would, would please God. And God says, no, I will build my own house. I will tell Solomon what to put in that house because the house of the Lord is the house from which God speaks to his people. And I'm hoping this morning, friends, as we gather for this first time, that we are excited about being in the house of the Lord again because we want to hear the voice of the Lord corporately. Let me tell you about two things that happen when we come to the house of the Lord. The psalmist in Psalm 27 and verse 4 says this, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, here it is, to behold the beauty of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord. What does it mean to behold the beauty of the Lord? I, I, one thing my wife will tell you sometimes, I'm very careful about words. I love words, but I have to be very careful about them. And one of the things I keep hearing of church services today, we met together and God showed up. My friends, the house belongs to God. In the Laodicean church, they had become so worldly that Jesus was outside asking for entrance inside. And when, when we come together, are we desirous? I miss seeing you. I miss seeing the, the, the faces that are here this morning. But I ask you this morning, are you here to behold the beauty of the Lord? Now, what is the beauty of the Lord? The beauty of the Lord, my friends, is the presence of perfection. It is love that is indescribable. It is long-suffering that benefits me. It is kindness beyond comprehension. Do you remember when Moses asked, God, show me your beauty, your glory, and God says, you can't see that, but I will let my goodness pass before you? Same idea as the kindness of God. That this morning, we are here not simply to see our friends and rightly so. But ultimately we are here that we might behold the beauty of the Lord. That, that the excitement that we felt when we were invited or reminded that we would be meeting was not simply I'll get to see my friends, but I shall be able to look into the face of God by faith and grasp something of the grace in which I stand. A second thing that happens when we come into the house of the Lord is that we inquire. We inquire. 
The word means to search out. It means to investigate. It, it means to feel a pricking, if you please, when God speaks and we feel the need to ask him, Lord, what does that mean? Do you recall my friends Jesus in his high priestly prayer when he was praying in John chapter 17? He opened his prayer by saying, this is life eternal that they might know thee. Know thee. What is your soul longing for this morning? As you see the beauty of the Lord, what are you desirous of inquiring of the Lord? A few weeks ago, a couple of Wednesday nights ago, I think, I, I spoke on the severity, the kindness and the severity of God. And, and, and I, mentioned, I mentioned that for a lot of Christians, they don't, they don't mind talking about the kindness, but not the severity. We don't mind talking about heaven, but not hell. And Paul says, I have, I have, I have not failed in my calling from God to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I want to go beyond Calvary. According to Hebrews chapter 6, Calvary is the beginning place we, we, we start the spiritual journey. And it takes us right through to the place where until we see him face to face. That's where J.I. Packer is this morning. That's where Ravi Zacharias is this morning. That's where my mother is this morning. That's where relatives of yours who have gone on before, that's where they are. But until we get there, my friends, we must be inquiring. We must be searching the scriptures to see. Do we, do, I spoke to a friend yes, uh, yesterday from up in northern uh, Canada. And, and the person said, oh, it's so good to hear your voice. I, I want to tell you, I'm camping out in, <laughs> see, because that's a phrase that I use in my quiet time. I'm camping out. And as close as I get to camping, as you know. <laughs> I'm camping out in the book of Matthew. And, and right now, I am camping out in Matthew 19. And I am listening and in, investigating my spirit before the Lord. I am, I am used to Matthew 19. I've read it before. I've preached from it before. I've studied it before. But I ask God that I might come to this text with a fresh passion to understand words beyond printed letters on a page. And, and I am not trying to impress you, my friends. I've, I've been in the first four Verses of Matthew 19, for days, for days. The one question that was asked of Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus never answered the question. He answered it with a question, have you not read? Read what? that the creator, he, the creator, from the beginning, he made them male and female and said, for this reason, please listen, what reason? The reason of a man and a woman coming together, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall become one and i'm investigating that i'm inquiring i just don't want to say it's wrong for a man to marry a man or it's wrong for a woman to mar marry a woman i just don't want to say that i want to be able to unveil it so that when i explain it to people my answer to their question comes not from my own idea of what i like and don't like but from the author of the whole idea initially inquiring of the Lord. Well, we go from verses 1 and 2 to 
to verses 4 and 5, and then another text we shall see, the atmosphere, the anticipation of gathering. Now, what, what is the atmosphere when we come into the house of the Lord? Listen to what the psalmist says. We want to come to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There's a festival. There's a festival. The whole idea of thanksgiving is a celebration. How thankful we ought to be, friends. You know, I was thinking of that this morning. And I trust that God will continue to bless us this way. That with all that has taken place since COVID-19 has been doing its deadly work, that God has preserved our congregation and we have lost no one as a result of COVID-19. That's something to be thankful for. That, that, that God has kept us in our, in, our, in our homes, on the roads, to give thanks to whom the name of the Lord directs the name of the Lord, the character and the capacity of God. Whenever you see that word name of the Lord, it is talking about the, the person, not simply the name. Thanks in, in this context is a celebration for something received from someone. You can't say thanks to the air, to the breeze, to the walls, because the walls, I, 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 in one of Ravi Zacharias' book, he talks about several years ago when there was a chess, chess match between the, the Russian chess expert and, and, a, and a computer. And, and the chess expert from Russia went into hiding because he didn't want to be defeated by, to be defeated by a computer. Deep Blue, I think, is the name of the computer. Deep Blue. And, and so, one professor wrote, <laughs> I love this, so why should he be afraid to be beaten by a computer? A computer doesn't have anything in it that we didn't put in it. Can Deep Blue says, I'm going to see Deep Green after my victory to take her out for supper? No, it's just a machine. What, what, what I'm getting at, friends, someone has to do something to create a sense of gratitude in us so that we give thanks. See, thanks and gratitude are not the same thing. Gratitude is the root. Thanks is the fruit. It, it is having this sense, having this sense that we have not been alone even though we have been alone. How thankful I am, like I said before, those names that I have mentioned. How thankful I am for, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. And, and I just say this because it's true. Steve has been so patient with me. You know, some morning I, I, send, I send the, uh, the, um, the devotional for the next morning. And I say, whew, I'm glad that it's done. I love doing it. I love it. But then I'll get a text from Steve. I didn't get the message. I got the information, but not the message. Oh, I said, oh, my word. And he will take me through. So this week, I haven't made any errors. It's been going through this week, so he's a good, he's a good teacher. My friends, I don't say that carelessly. When I talk about what others have done to make live streaming possible. There are people listening this morning to my voice from this pulpit all across this country this morning. Lo Lois gets it. I don't have Facebook. And, 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 but Lois get, gets messages from Alberta, from Toronto, from Belize, from California concerning what God is speaking through out of a sudden, Sodaville is known in other parts of the world. <laughs> Thanks. 
God makes all things to work together for good. Psalm 95 verses 1 and 2. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to him and bless his name. Psalm 100 and 100 verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. See, the reason you're entering his gates with thanksgiving is because you left home with a sense of gratitude, celebrating what God has already done. And you come together to share this. There's a remarkable, remarkable passage of Scripture in Deuteronomy 16, 14. Deuteronomy 16, 14. It reads this way. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and your female servant, and the stranger and the orphans and the widows who are in your tongue. God says, I want you to rejoice, to have a festival. Now, now you, you, you know me. I'm not going to jump up and down. I, uh, someone asked me about raising hand, and I said to them, I'm a toe topper. <laughs> I'm a toe topper, right? Toe, you know, it's, um, it, but it's not that I'm not happy. Because, my friends, part of coming into the house of the Lord is for a festival. To give thanks to God. To actually be able to count your blessings, name them one by one. For his, for his grace to you. Uh, the other morning, or no, it was the afternoon, I, I, was, I was fixing supper and uh, was finished, and so we were having grace. And, and I said this to the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you that the meal today was provided yesterday because this is leftover from last night. Have you, have you ever thought of that? That, that? that there's so much the first day. See, we were, we were, we were going, getting some stuff from uh, Olive Gardens. And if you, if you bought one, you get two. So when we bought one for today, we had meal for tomorrow. How gracious is God? How good is God? Do you sit here this morning, friends, with a sense of gratitude? Do you feel like standing to your feet and say, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift? It's supposed to be a festival. I, I, don't, I hope there's a smile behind those masks. Because, friends, we are here this morning because God is good. So there's a festival. But if you look in the psalm again, you will see the psalm is saying something else. Not only is there a festival, but there is a fellowship. There's a fellowship. Listen, listen as I read Psalm 122 again. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together. You know, that is not talking simply about the building. In, in the Bible, Jerusalem is used not only for a place, but a people. And the psalmist is saying, when we come together for this festival, we are compact together. We are related. You know, the CDC might say we have to have chairs spread out six feet apart. But listen. Listen. The connections we have, CDC can do absolutely nothing about it. We are compacted together. We, our bloodline is not from our parents. Our bloodline is from Calvary. And that, that is what Paul said. We must do our best to keep the unity of the spirit. We are compact together. When, when we are called the city of God, St. Augustine wrote a book called 
the city of God in which he puts the city of man and the city of God and tries to give the, the contrast. I, I, I tell you this, what's the time here? I got a magazine from one of my alma mater yesterday, two days ago, and in there there was a quotation from Dr. Francis Schaeffer, the last doc, late Dr. Francis Schaeffer, and, and that quotation went this way. Oh, I love it, it says. Listen to it. Tell me what the world is saying today, and seven years from now I'll tell you what the church is saying. Do you get that? May God help us. We don't want to say what the world is saying. We want to say what God is saying. Because that's what we constantly do. My friends, if you listen, if you listen to some messages today, our sermons, what, please forgive me, what we hear on the streets of Portland, the anger, the bitterness, it's the same thing you hear in some of the churches. So, so when we come together, we must make sure that the bind that we have is such, my friends, that it doesn't come from man. It comes from God. Let me, let me quickly say this. The, the, the atmosphere in the church is one of fellowship. Because when the church comes together, when the church comes together, it educates, it educates the invisible world. May I repeat that? When the church comes together, it educates the invisible world. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul is talking about the mystery that has been revealed to him. 1 Peter 1 says that when the prophets wrote, when angels heard, when angels said goodbye to Jesus, as it were, when they were leaving heaven, they, they were longing to look into what the prophets were supposed to write about the incarnation and about the, the birth of, of God's Son who eternally exists. And then Peter says, uh, Paul says, now what the angels looked into in heaven to understand the saving grace of God. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10 of the text. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Our gathering here this morning is an education for the invisible world. We have spectators beyond us this morning. So when the church comes together, it is doing more than what is happening face to face. Because of time, let me read what one of my favorite men, Dr. John Stott, says. And I'm glad that when I can quote John Stott, because I believe like he is, it's a privilege. So then, right, Dr. Stott, as the gospel spreads through the world, this new and variated Christian community is developing. It is as if a great drama is being enacted. History is the theater. The world is the stage. And the church members in every land are the actors. God himself has written the play. And he directs and produces it. Act by act scene by scene, the story contains, continues to unfold. But who are the audience? They are the cosmic intelligence, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. We are to think then of them as spectators of the drama of salvation. Thus, the history of the Christian church Listen to this. The history of the Christian church becomes a graduate studies for angels. I love that. Only an Englishman can say that. The church is a place, my friends, where angels learn. And you know, as I was studying this, my heart broke. My heart broke. 
Because I listened to one of our ministers not too long ago. I was in a meeting with him along with other ministers. And he talked about what is happening in his church right now as I'm speaking. Because of people who say, I won't go, I won't go if they're wearing masks. And then people who say, I won't go if they're not wearing masks. And, and, and I won't go unless... And the, the devil has been so subtle that he's using this very thing to divide the church of God because he knows that as long as he can keep us divided, angels will never learn. That's why I'm thankful for your faithfulness to God here in Sotoville Church. We all have concerns, but oh God, may no concern ever make us a divided people. We come to educate angels. And lastly, I'll close with this. The church also invigorates the visible world. It educates the invisible world, but it invigorates the visible world. Turn quickly to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. And as you turn, I will read. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. This is a psalmist saying, for the saints, talking about believers. For the saints who are in the world where you and I are, they are the majestic ones in whom I take delight. Oh, friends, listen. I wonder, I wonder if, if as you were coming this morning and I was expecting you, if, if I were thinking of you as the majestic ones, that, that my attitude of anticipation was not simply from God to me, but from God to me, to you. I want, to, I want to invigorate you with the, with the things of God so that you will have your delight in God so that I do not think of anyone coming to this congregation, which I hope they don't come here Sunday morning. Or I hope they don't come here Wednesday evening. No, friends. The saints should be the people that gives me the greatest joy, gives me the greatest sense of encouragement, the saints should be those, my friends, that I think about in an elevated way, not in a way. I, I was reading of um, um, Secretary of State, um, what's his first name? His last name is Stanton. He was the Secretary of War for um, um, Lincoln. And, and before, before Stanton became Secretary of War for Lincoln, he just, he just hated Lincoln. He said all kinds of nasty things about Lincoln. At one point, he was heard saying, uh, if you can't make it to the zoo, just look at the, the, the president and you'll find a good um, um, replica of, and he went on. And then, and then, when Abraham Lincoln needed a secretary of war during the Revolutionary War, guess who he chose? Stanton. And someone asked him, why did you choose Stanton for such a position? You know what he said? Because he was the best man for it. And when Lincoln was shot, the one who led the, the investigation from the House was the Secretary of War. My friends, if a man can do that for another man, what can we not do for the people of God that have grace? What can we not do? You should leave this place this morning, my friends, with a sense of excitement. Your cup should be full and running over. Finally, we're back together again, but we are back together in the house of the Lord. We have heard the Lord speaking, and because we have heard him speaking, our souls are just flowing with gratitude to God. We will leave this place with a delight that we did not bring into it because God has spoken. I close with the prayer found in the Anglican, the Scottish prayer book. I don't always read prayers, but I think this was quite appropriate. In closing, I read, O Christ, 
you have opened to us the scriptures and have been known to us by the breaking of the bread. Stay with us, we pray, that we may go in the strength of your presence and your truth all our journey and at the end behold you in the glory of the eternal trinity God forever. Amen. You have opened your word to us. The symbols have been there. We have the cross. We have the pulpit. We have the communion table. Go in the strength of what these things provide for us. And when we go, may the delights of our lives be a witness to what God does for those who put their trust in him. Thank you so much for being out this morning. And may God be pleased to increase our tribe as we are faithful to him. Please stand and join us in the singing of our closing hymn. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all times and now and forever. Amen. God bless you. You will leave through these doors. 
you may visit outside, six feet apart from other people, but thanks so much for being a part of the service this morning.